Okay. What a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Now you can see Gordon McRae marching across the plains of Oklahoma. Now you know what my students felt like when their crazy teacher walked into the classroom and started singing at them at 7 in the morning. It was really scary. We welcome you today. It is a beautiful day here, and I love Kevin's prelude, all of some of those hymns that we love so dearly. Rejoice, you pure in heart. Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. Let us worship together. Amen. Uh, and so here's a crazy Oklahoman to carry it on. The Lord be with you. The Lord lift up all who search for God's love. Lord, lift us to be the help that I seek. Join me in the opening prayer. Lord, as we prepare for worship today, turn our hearts to hear the voice once again. Open our minds to your understanding. Open our hearts to others who seek your face. Open our attitude to free us for service. Set our feet on the path so we can follow you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's all take part in the opening hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs>
Sunday to do it. <laughs> if, if, okay, Rick, you can come on up. Would, would you guys help me out as well? If you want to do that more, come on up. Anybody else? Maybe you didn't grow up in a church like <laughs> I did. All right. Is that better? Yeah. All right. So, so here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about what you have to do before you're ready to go on a journey. Um, I got up at 5 this morning. Uh, my brother Bob and I got up. Uh, well, it was 540. But anyway, we, um, we rode all the way here from Los Osos. But when you ride a bike, or you ride a motorcycle, or you just ride on a skateboard, or whatever it is that you do, you got to be prepared. And this preparation part, when you go on a journey, is really big. Uh, the faster you go, the bigger it is. So, um, so this is what uh, I, I just decided. Why well, try to change before coming into church? So, um, you, would you? Anybody want to want to try this? Oh, please come on up. All right. It's kind of like putting on the firefighters. Now, see how heavy that is? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's, it is nice and warm. That's probably just sweat. But um, anyway. <laughs> and this is, uh, we got padding here on the elbows. Uh, forearms, yeah. Well, yeah, okay. And now it's elbows. There you go. There you go. Right like that. And then on the back, if you turn around, this is actually an entire back pad that goes down here. And that's designed for impact and so forth. And you can put on, uh, you can actually get a map that you can tuck in there so you can grab it if you need to. It's not advisable while you're writing, but anyway, you can do that. And then also this comes, if you'll turn around one more time, there's, um, there's this liner, which is all mesh, so the wind goes right through it. That cools you off. It's important to be comfortable so you don't get distracted. Same with bike riders, right? Sometimes you have fitted, sometimes you have to put a little more on. And this is a waterproof lining that's in here. So actually, if the rain goes all the way through, it drains out the bottom of the jacket. But it, but it doesn't get you wet, all right? So that's the jacket part. And it's not very light, is it? No. No, no. Okay, thank you. So you can take it off if you'd like. All right, so these are the motorcycle pants. So if you'll just knock right there. Yeah, so we got more we got more in here. There's one over there too. Yeah, okay, all right. And then of course reflective strips so everybody can see right. And then there is Kevlar in these. So um, there's something called a slide factor. We won't talk about that right now. <laughs> I don't think on bicycles you get that that uh, protective, yeah, right? Protection. This is Mohawk Highway. There you go. Okay. <laughs> That's a slide factor as well, but uh, anyway, or road rash as we call it. Well, I want to tell all of you that are at home, and if there are if children that are watching right now, um, I'm not saying that anybody should get on a motorcycle and ride unless you absolutely think that that is the best way for you to go somewhere, and that you take courses. Um, I've taken... I've been riding since I was 15. We started out on mini bikes and my brother and I, stuff we built most of the time. And, uh, and then I thought I knew it all. And then I went and took a course uh, with the highway patrol. And uh, that was two weeks and it was about 20 hours of training. And I couldn't believe how much I didn't know. And I'm uh, getting ready this year to go back and take another course um, in advanced safety. Um, and then, uh, then if you ride dirt, then you, you figure out ways to do that. Just like on bicycles, there's cross-country kind of bike riding. That's one kind of training. There's street riding and so forth. With all this preparation, though, with everything that you put on to try to stay safe, the most important thing that happens is communication. So now they make these great... Oh, I forgot to talk about the helmet. I'll get to that. But, um, but the... Uh, could you hold my helmet for me? There you go. That's not light either, is it? Oh, you do. That's right. You ride. I forgot. And uh, this is a quiet helmet because anything that's over 70 decibels uh, damages your hearing after, after even just a couple of months of riding. So it's one of the quieter helmets. But instead of having the communication in there, I have it in my ears. So this is a Bluetooth. Um, and I can then hear navigation and sometimes listen to a little music. I was jamming on some praise music coming here this morning. 
Um, and, but however, I've discovered that in life, all this protection and all these things that protect your brain and so forth and keep the bugs out of your teeth, like on here. <laughs> these little gnats, see there are gnats all over that, right? Yeah. Those little gnats there are all collected from the central coast. This one from Santa Barbara says hi. Um, well, he's not talking anymore, but anyway. Um, on any journey, on every journey, the most important voice that we hear is not even the one in our own head that's talking all the time, telling us things like, you're not worthy, you can't do this, you should be afraid of everything in life, to a different voice. And that's the voice of God. So the most important thing, in my opinion, about motorcycle riding is saying a prayer before I leave over me and also the people I'm riding with. Lord, will you watch over us? Help us be alert and smart. And you do stupid things, stupid things happen. But knowing the voice of God, through all the clutter in our life, through all the chatter, through all the noise that we hear, whether it's on the road or even in our homes or even as our mind fills with stuff, if we don't hear the voice of God, then the journey is so much more dangerous and so much more plight with pit holes, pitfalls and, you know, holes in the pavement and stuff you hit that you don't even see and all of a sudden you realize you're, you're out of control. The voice of God. This is what Jesus tried to explain to the Pharisees that trapped him in the temple one day. He was saying to them, because they were saying, are you really the Messiah? If you are, just tell us because we're ready to kill you if you say you are. That was the subtext of our scripture today. It's not written there, but you find out later they didn't really care to follow the Lord. And can you hear the voice of God? Jesus said, you say that you don't believe. You don't believe because you don't understand me because you don't hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. And I am followed by those who hear me. I think that's... That's for me is when we tune in, we, we pause, we try to silence the chatter in our heads, all this stuff going on to just hear the voice of God once in a while, which never comes out this way, by the way. God never says to us, not that I'm aware of, you're not worthy, you're not worth it, life is going to get worse, no reason to continue to live. I know that if you're a teenager hearing my voice today, you might think at times that life is not worth living. That's not the voice of God. The voice of God is not one of anger or judgment. It's not one of persecution. It's not one that tells you that you're not worthy. Because under God's light and in God's grace, we are always worthy. In fact, we are precious. In fact, we are the ambassadors of Christ in the world today. Amen. 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 So ride safely, whatever you do, wherever you go, but take God with you. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for how you watch over us. Thank you for how you encourage us, even when it seems like the darkest hour. It is always darkest right before the dawn. We ask this, we believe this, and we trust this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you all. The scripture today is from John 10, 22 through 30. At the time the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem... It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? Are you the Messiah? Tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life 
and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, in regard to what he has given me, is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. pastor just asked me to teach you all how to sing that verse. Um, yeah, so basically the, um, the melody goes... And then the words are... Si aham ba kuka nyani kwenkos. Si aham ba kuka nyani kwenkos. Oh, the English version. Okay, the English version is... yeah. <laughs> It's uh, so same same melody. Uh, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We so actually just keeps repeating that. So let's just try it a little bit. See if it works. So one, two, three. Yeah, 
great job. Thank you, thank you, thank you, choir. That was great. You guys are about to dance out of your shoes. I can see it. it is a day to celebrate. It's it's still Easter tide. We are still in the season of Easter. We're still in the season of resurrection. I've taken things that are oh really again okay. It is Easter time. It is the time in which we are living in the resurrection. And it's a great day to celebrate what God has done for us and to remember that there are times we, we really don't necessarily get an audible, but in our heart of hearts, in our soul way deep down there, sometimes we actually can hear or perceive the voice of God. Jesus wasn't just talking metaphorically about being able to hear his voice and to know that God's voice is different than other voices and there are many voices out there today and the children's time I was touching on this issue that has become a prevalent issue and we really can't talk about the recovery from COVID or getting back into something we call the new normal unless we address the fact that there are people a lot of our children and youth especially who are hearing a voice that tells them life will never get better, that life will never get better. And when you have no hope, then you have no reason to live. And this is something that uh, continues to be a real challenge. Last night I was sitting at a table with uh, some other writers and um, uh, it took a couple days to go be with this motorcycle group. Uh, it's a BMW um, Owners Association. And uh, so as I was sitting at the table with this person, she had shared the night before that she was a marriage and family therapist. And we started to kind of go from, so what kind of bike do you ride? Oh, what kind of bike do you ride? To where did you go today? To hey, let's talk about suicide. So um, the... Typical dinner conversation, right? So, but as a marriage and family therapist, uh, she and her husband, both marriage and family therapists, and they're still married happily, uh, they live in Reno, and uh, she's part of the LDS church. And she said, you know, she said to me, I don't, I don't think the church is addressing this issue well. And I said, I, I agree. I don't think the church ever addresses this issue well. Some, somehow, we... Don't talk about things that really matter to people. And so I wonder what, sometime why we're surprised when people don't want to come to church when church might just be a good show, you know, some music and maybe something to think about and maybe some fellowship and a donut or a coffee or something. But what people would come to church for would be things that are life-changing things that challenge their families, things that are happening in their grandchildren's lives, their inability to address somebody in their family that feels depressed all the time or is dealing with some serious issues. Now, a church that cares about those things is a church that people would probably come to. But it's very hard to get to that subject matter without it becoming very personal. And so when sharing our own story about how we have heard the voice of God in our life or that there's been a time in which we really sensed that uh, we had some direction or we had a discernment or we had some good judgment about what was next because we gave God credit for that moment in which we heard the voice of God. Now, I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I, I'd be curious to know how many of you here and how many of you that are part of our Facebook Live today have heard God speak to you whether that was a still small voice or whether that was some loud voice, whether that was something that you just had as a passing thought, but it came back enough times that you sort of felt like, okay, maybe this is something. Maybe this is not just indigestion. Maybe I really do have something going on in my life that I wanted to address here. Well, that would be a blessing for us to pay attention to that. In fact, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something a little risky this morning. Um, not ride a motorcycle, but uh, unless you want to. Uh, but I would like you to uh, actually risk a little bit right now in your own thoughts. 
to think about the last time that you felt like you actually heard or sensed God's direction in your life. God's voice or God's nudge or whatever you want to call that. To sit there for a moment today and just think, when was the last time you felt that God was speaking directly, more directly to you? Now here's the risky part. Are you willing to share that story with someone sitting next to you? I'm going to give you four minutes of my sermon time. So if we're late today, it's your fault. But uh, (laughs) I'd like to give you a few minutes to share your story. Now, you can do that with a family member, or you can do that with somebody else, or you might just want to hang on to that story yourself, and if that's true, then fine. Just listen to the person who does want to share. So move, if you like, go sit to some, next to somebody that you'd like to get to know better, or just stay right where you are, whatever works for you. But I'd like you to seriously think When was the last time I felt like I had a nudge or I had some indication from God that was important to me? Go.
All right. How was that? It's okay. If you felt uncomfortable because you didn't want to share or you didn't have someone to share with, then I would be more than happy to uh, hear your story sometime when you are. It's not easy to talk about these things sometimes. But did anybody have, you know, a raging God, flaming inferno, shouting out of a burning bush kind of thing going on? Or God coming at you like, oh, Man, have you screwed up. Oh man, do we have a lot of we have a lot to fix. And I'm so glad you're finally paying attention. Anybody have that kind of vengeful experience? I think we have a sense of humor. Oh yeah. God has a sense of humor because God decided that we would be God's people, right? And look at us, right? So Yeah. Yeah, and here we are, right? Right. That's true. Well, here's the thing about it, that when we have a preconceived notion of what God is supposed to sound like, or what God's supposed to do when God shows up, then we are in the same boat as the Pharisees. These were the people who were running the religious organization. But these weren't Pharisees Pharisees that were actually here, because the Pharisees were not involved with the temple The Pharisees were assigned to the synagogues. The Pharisees were more like common, ordinary rabbis and teachers to ordinary people. But the folks that were in the temple under the colonnades of Solomon, as is described here in the book of John, these were Sadducees. These were kind of the elite teachers. These were sort of the one level up. They were supposed to not only have greater depth of knowledge of the Torah and the Pentateuch and the teaching of wisdom books. The wisdom books, by the way, are Psalms, Proverbs, and the book of Job is a part of that wisdom book. So Job itself was a teaching uh, text in which people could see how bad life could get and yet God was still there. And so these wisdom books became very important in terms of Judaism and Israeli um, development and the reason that it was good to talk about bad things was because even as bad as it could get even as it got that bad for Job there was in fact hope at the other end of it because if anybody had reason to, to stop life himself it would have been Job or a countless number of other people in the scriptures so Jesus is having this conversation with some people that he already knows. He knows their heart. He knows that they didn't come asking, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. If you just tell us, we'll believe. But they weren't interested in believing. They were interested in Jesus implicating himself in a blasphemy, an act against God directly, that he would claim that he was the Messiah to come. And why during the Festival of Dedication? Well, the Festival of Dedication took place usually in the winter months of Israel, and it, we know it today as Hanukkah. We, we would know it today as, mistakenly, some of us call this sort of the Jewish Christmas. Please don't say that to anybody, especially somebody who's Jewish. Christmas itself is the birth of Christ, this merging of, in our faith, a human and the divine. But Hanukkah was a celebration of independence, not a, not a celebration of the coming of the Messiah. That is a different celebration. So it is a search for answers while it's a remembrance of what God did for them. So if you don't know the story of Hanukkah, there was a, an attack coming on by the Maccabeans. They were going to take over and kill all who did not believe in their particular form of faith. And so they were coming to attack and there was not enough oil in the lamps. As long as the lamps would stay lit, the attack would not start. And so they prayed and they believed that God would provide for them. That's why there's eight normal candles in the menorah and then there's a center one. 
but there's eight days of Hanukkah, and, and as this is happening, the oil that should have only lasted for two or three days lasted for all eight days, and it staved off the attack. So this is more like an Independence Day celebration. And during this time of the festival of dedication, dedicating their lives to God once again because of God's provision for them, there was this notion that the Messiah would show up and the Messiah would set things all right. So just as they were spared from the Maccabeans, they would also now be spared from Rome that the people that were now on siege of the in siege of their land and of their life and of their temple and of everything that they believed to be holy, this would be a time in which the Messiah would show up and set all things straight. So you see, Jesus was just a huge disappointment to them. And at this point in which he's there teaching a rare time, but he's teaching in the temple. It's probably near the last or third part of his year of uh, development, his ministry, his mission. John doesn't care once again where he places these things. So how Jesus gets there and why he's there in the festival of dedication, we don't know. But it, it was between these other two major festivals. And you know that he went there for the Seder meal for the Passover, the high holy festival of the Passover, which was the last week of his life. So sometime before that, maybe the winter before, there's Jesus in the, in walking along the... Why talk about the where he is in the temple? That's very interesting, isn't it, that he's not in one of the courts. There were three courts in the temple. There was the women's court. That was the outside temple. Women were allowed to come in that far, but not any further. And then there was the men's courtyard. And then there was the rise to what would be considered the Holy of Holies or an inner temple courtyard in the Holy of Holies. And so this is not in the central part of the temple, but it's along the the, the, the corridors or the sidewalks where the colonnades would shape the outside of the temple. We know a little bit about the temple architecture. We don't know a lot, but... There, there were no plans as built that we can look at. But we can have a pretty good idea. And so Jesus is not in the place where he would teach, but he's in the place where he would be amongst the people. And that's where they trap him. So he says these words to them. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He's emphasizing here to hear, to know and to follow. To hear, to know, and to follow. These three things make us more aligned with God's purpose and drive in our life when we can hear God, when we actually have time to hear God. There's, there's a big push today for something called centering prayer. I've mentioned this. You know if you've read anything recently about spiritual endeavors. Centering prayer and yoga and some of these other practices that might even be from Eastern religions are, in fact, a way for us to to tune in, to be present with God in ways that we can't when we're just running from here to there or when the TV's blasting in our ear or when we're constantly writing with music pounding out in our ears. There's times in which we need to turn off the radio of the car. There is a button, by the way, that turns it off. I don't know if you knew that, but... Um, and, and there is a, something called a remote control that has an off switch at home. There's even something called a sleep timer. Have you ever known that your TV will turn itself off? It's smart enough to know you've had enough. So if you, uh, if you really don't know when you've had enough, you can always start to watch and set it for two hours of whatever it is you're going to be involved in, unless it's a Padre game. You want to make sure that you leave enough time for extra innings. But in the meantime, if you, you know, that's just one spiritual discipline. I have a friend who will sit down at night and, and watch her favorite program, but you know how all the programs run into each other now? Because they've learned that if they throw commercials in there, you're out of the room and you may never come back. So they, they move over into a little box at the end of one show while they start another one, right? And so this is all about, you know, or Netflix where... They have something coming up. Oh my gosh, 12 seconds to the next one. I don't, what can I? I don't, 12, I don't know, 12 seconds. Oh no, four seconds. I don't know. Should I watch the shortest? Oh, okay, I'm in. That's how Netflix hooks you. 
They start the next one for you. And then the next time you get on there, they suggest what's good for you. What's not just suggested, but I actually saw this in one of the little captions. This is going to be good for you. It's not going to be good for you if you decided to sit down for one hour and not five hours and binge watch something, right? So this is the hearing God's voice. Jesus wanted to make sure we knew that unless we had a relationship so close and so intimate that we could hear his voice, that religion itself doesn't hold much value for us. I'm not waving, by the way, there are gnats up here, so I'm just finishing. Maybe they came in on the helmet and they really weren't dead. I don't know. But, <laughs> but uh, this was to hear and be clear of God's presence with us, to have a relationship with God. Jesus says in here, I know them. In Greek, this is a powerful word. To know somebody in Greek is to uh, be intimately aware of who they are, their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength. In the Hebrew, to know somebody means something even completely different and more than that. It's to know somebody physically, emotionally, connected to another person. So Jesus wanted to make sure that they understood that his sheep were going to relate to him because they knew him and he knows them. And then the third is, then when they have this relationship, they're able to follow me. But you obviously don't want to know me. You want to just see what I'm going to fix. And this is where they struggled. In verse 28, I gave them eternal life and they will never perish. See, that's not a precursor to being someone who follows Christ. This speaks to some of the modern day theology that the only reason to be a follower of Jesus Christ is to get your ticket punched so that when you die, you go north, not south. There are plenty of people today who will preach sermons about getting your ticket punched so that the very goal in your life is your destination. I don't think the goal of Christian faith is a destination. I don't think Jesus taught us to sit around and wait until that day comes so that you make sure you go one direction and not the other. In fact, he warned against that. They would ask, well, when are you going to return? When are you going to come back? And he would say very clearly, that's not for you to know. That's not for even me to know. I know that the Father knows. And like a thief in the night or a flash of light, something is going to happen that's going to make sure we know that the time has come for us, all of us, to be going home. And that all is a pretty big category. It's a whole lot bigger than 144,000. It's a whole lot bigger than the universe we painted. It's a whole lot bigger than some denominational uh, kind of bracket on the ends of life or or that somehow it's in the middle of the date we're born and the date we die and the you know have you ever heard the poem of the of the hyphen the beauty of the hyphen oh i'll bring that to you sometime the beauty of the hyphen is that's where all of your life has lived been lived on this earth is in between those two important dates But we always talk about a person who's born a certain time and dies a certain time like those are the highlights of their life. Well, we don't remember when we were born and the day we go out of this world and into the next, that that may be, uh, I don't know, that could be a highlight, I suppose, but not for most. So really, it's about the faith in the middle. What happens in the time that we're here? I give them eternal life. I give that to them. I give it. It's not something we earn. And then they will never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. So the people that know me, that talk to me, that I talk to, the sheep, those are the ones that I'm interested in. It's not complicated, but it sure was not comforting in those times. And frankly, it's not comfortable Today, there are people that think that God's a little slow on the uptake here on getting rid of this thing called COVID. I don't think it's God's business to get rid of COVID. I think that's our business. But it is our business to be faithful while we deal with this and whatever the next pandemic is going to look like. It's up to the church to take care of the hungry. Some people feel like we're a little slow 
on getting God to somehow provide for the rest of the world. It's not God's job to feed the world. It's ours. It's not God's purpose or even desire to reset our political climate in the United States. God's smart enough to not even get involved with that, I mean, in some way, shape, or form. But God's not limited. God certainly could provide for us another King David, or God could bring along the best leader ever for for the world, one leader for the whole world. Oh, yeah, he did. His name is Jesus Christ. And he comes with this grace and forgiveness and redemption and resurrection for all people. That's God's business, reconciling us. As I said last week, it was the the introduction of Peter back into his new life or the reinstatement of Peter as a disciple. So this is all of what Jesus is trying to teach them, and they obviously were not happy about this because the next thing they do, the second he said, I am that Messiah, if you need to hear this, But you don't know it. You don't believe it. They picked up stones and they were ready to kill him once again. And then he explains. He goes on. He explains why this is so important. And then they're ready even more to kill him. But he evades that and he leaves and he comes back another time. See, I I have a firm suspicion that we as the church, while we're sitting around waiting for God to fix stuff, We really have one job to do as Christians that leads to all the other things that we need to do about taking care of the hungry and working to make sure that we bring peace in our own land so that we don't end up feeling like we have to take over some other country or have some power struggle somewhere else in life. I believe firmly that God has stuff for us to do, and I think that Jesus was clear tell your story. Whatever you just shared at the beginning of this message today is life-changing for other people. They want to know that we're not about just trying to get them through the doors of our particular church in a particular part of the country. People truly are interested in life-giving, hope-giving messages of if God participated in your life this way, then there's hope that I too can have this same walk that you have. I got to share with, you know, two beautiful young women here, Morgan and Emma, and they they said, we're not sure. And I said, well, I'll talk. They said, okay. And so (laughs) I shared my story. But my story is about figuring out I'm going to be a preacher and not a marine zoologist. That was a really important, pivotal time in my life. And I've dedicated my life back to being a preacher every day. From 22 to 62, it's a journey every day. Isn't your life a journey? It's not an end date. It's not a destination. It's a journey. And I don't think God would love anything more than for us to take that journey with God through Christ, and tell somebody else once in a while. What a glorious way to live, giving hope and bringing hope to other people. I have a special prayer request to add to our list today, if you will, Mary Beth. Um, You can remember it. It'll It'll be very brief, but I'd like for us to be praying for our high school teachers and counselors and coaches And for our entry admission counselors and coaches for universities, for those people that serve in our community and those people that are ready to receive and bring into the new community those who are going off to college, whether it be two-year, whether it be city, whether it be a university or college, wherever it is, to keep these people in mind. Uh, My new friend who was sitting next to me at dinner last night, she volunteers to go to elementary school. She's actually a marriage and family therapist working in a much higher, more lucrative job, but she volunteers her time as an elementary school therapist. 
and she goes and meets with parents and their children to make sure that they know that life is never so bad that you have to end it. So I'd love for us to pray for all those folks today, if you will add that. Let me pray for you. God, today on this day when we search our hearts and minds often in worship, thinking about what you've brought forth in the gospel, may we be of one mind on this point. That our life is truly in your hands. We thank you for knowing us and for hearing us. We want to hear your voice. Amen. We have a song to, to share, and Kevin and I have not even rehearsed this, but I just want to share some words with you and then have you sing that with us as we close off today. Yeah. Can we bring the words up there? It goes like this. I am your servant, and I am listening. Speak to me, Lord, speak to me. I need your wisdom, your truth and comfort. Speak to me, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to me. Through your word, through your spirit, speak your words of life. Speak to me, speak to me. I am listening, I am waiting, speak to me. Let's just sing the chorus one more time. Speak to me. Speak to me through your word, through your wit, speak your words of life. Speak to me, speak to me. and hopefully following you. We know that there are needs in the world. We know that there are needs all around us in our local areas. We are grateful that we can join together with others in our Calpac churches, the Chatsworth United Methodist Church and the First United Methodist Church in Ventura. Let our hearts be joined in joy, in thanksgiving, in confession, and in supplication. We praise, Father, that Judy's CAT scan has shown her to be cancer-free. It's been a long journey, and we pray that she will continue cancer-free. We are grateful for Carol's success from back pain relief procedures. And again, pray that she will continue to be, have that relief. Father, Mother Nature again is acting up. We would pray for the firefighters and for all those in the way of fires. It's pervasive throughout the Western United States and in other parts of the world. And in parts of Canada, they're being flooded. Please, Father, be with all of those who are caretakers and first responders, and be with those who are affected and victims of these terrible occurrences. 
<clears throat> we pray, Father, that Frank and Debbie will con be continued to recover from their strokes. We pray that Brian <clears throat> will continue with his faith to gain strength and help recovering from his heart surgery. We pray, Father, for the team that is restoring Claremont for incoming refugees. There are those, Father, who are grieving. We would pray for all of them. Grief also is a journey, and it comes in waves. And yet, we know that you are with us and helping us over those hurdles. We pray especially for the passing of 45-year-old Life Markle and his family in Northern California, following a battle of homelessness and fighting against drugs and alcohol. We pray that you will be with all of those who are fighting that terrible, terrible disease inflicted by alcohol and drugs. Father, we continue to pray for all of those on our prayer list. And we pray, too, for those who are transitioning from the lower grades to the upper grades, from high school to college, from college to higher education. We pray that you will guide their teachers, their counselors, the faculty, in helping them make this transition. This is a very strange life in the life of high school students this month, where they are facing excitement for going out into the world and trepidation because they're leaving the womb. They're leaving the bubble of protection from teachers and parents in their community. Be with them as they make this transition and guide those who help them. Father, we pray for those in hospice. We pray for Robert, who has, cancer has taken over his body and is now in hospice. We pray for Carol's mother and Richard's mother. Be with all of them, Father. And be with all of those who are on our prayer list. And we take a moment to think of them and to pray for them. And now, Father, we join together in the prayer that Jesus has taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join together in thinking of our blessings as we give to God some of them.
Heavenly Father, we lift to you these, our gifts, our offerings, and also our time and our talents, that you may guide those who will help distribute them and will use them to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us continue standing and join in our closing hymn. sing that. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look long in his wonderful face. And the things on earth will grow strangely dim. And the light of his glory May we hear your words, O oh God, each time we call upon you. May we be able to quiet our minds and hearts long enough for you to respond each time we pray. And may we hear, O oh God, the marching orders you have for us, the guidance, the, the GPS for our life that we are looking for on a daily basis. We ask all of this as we go out and serve and share our story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, your GPS says sit down for just a couple of more minutes, but uh, <laughs> not you, not, not you, no. not you, that's right. <laughs> oh, goodness, are we not grateful to be here in St. Matthew's? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 If you weren't here last week and you're a mom, these are for you, so please pick one up on the way out during the basket. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, there are obviously continuing to be many things going on in our church. I understand yesterday was a great success with the women's group meeting, and that was lovely. Uh, Caneo Connect is continuing. Let's see, this week it is at Westlake Village, West Lake Village United Methodist Church. Um, and also we have going on uh, the men's study group on Wednesdays. Women's group is taking a hiatus until when, Carol? When do you start? Oh, the Bible study? Yeah. It's going to be June, starting June 14th. All right, starting June 14th. So you've got another month to kind of gear up. Mm -hmm. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, refurbishing the dorms, uh, please uh, call the church if you would like to participate in that. And oh, quilting. That is so far beyond me. <laughs> I can do the needle and thread bit, but putting all of that together, I have. <laughs> But it's, um, I have a couple of quilts that are very near and dear to me. One made by my husband's grandmother for our wedding gift and another made by my mother-in-law. So they're, they are treasures. Um, music Appreciation and Pentecost is coming up June 5th in the interim. Choir's meeting on Monday nights mm -hmm. at 7. And 6.30, used to be 7. <laughs> We really would like a few more people to come and sing with us. We're down to 12 sometimes, which is a great, perfect dozen. Yeah, but, yeah. hey, it's easy when you're marching, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, we have some special songs coming up, and we would love for um, new people to join us. It's time to start coming back. You can wear your mask. A lot of us do. Uh, <laughs> 
Graduation Sunday is June 12, so please get any information you have to the office so that that can be put together. And, uh, oh, the Grand and Me Camp. Yeah. That really sounds cool. It Mine is. Mine are now too big, but, you know, if you have grandparent kids that are younger, this is an awesome, looks awesome. It's pretty affordable as well. I just want to say that I think the deadline for the early bird might be today. But you can go on to, is it? It is today. So, uh, but that makes it for all the meals and everything else that goes with that. It's, uh, what is it for? We don't, yeah, it's 200 and something for a grandparent and a grandchild together. And if you have extra grandkids joining you, like we do, we're bringing six, six this year. Uh, it's like 75 extra per child, but that, that's all the meals. And, uh, and you, and you get your own cabin, if, unless we outgrow uh, the camp. But anyway, you know, if you're thinking about it, just ask Stephanie or I about this. We'd love to tell you. Yep. It sounds like a wonderful opportunity. Yeah. Those of us with older grandchildren are going, gee, I wish they had that when they were littler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Oh, concerts for Ukraine. Um, are, there's one today first. in Ventura and on March 29th in Thousand Oaks. Right. And I understand, I think I saw an article that they really were wonderful. Yeah. Um, also next Sunday, I know there is a handbell uh, concert at Westlake yeah. Village. Camarillo. Oh, Ca that's right, Camarillo United Methodist. Yeah, my neck of the woods. Um, Camarillo. Um, United Methodist Church. Some of you may remember Carlene Van Dyke, who was around for years and years, and I know worked with, with Kevin on occasion in the choir. And she emailed me and said, you need to go to this. Mm -hmm. So I under, I'm sure that it's going to be wonderful. Mm -hmm. You have a chance. Save the date. Ladies, women's retreat, October 1st. And that will come really, really fast. Mm -hmm. It just kind of zooms. Mm -hmm. Not zoom. Not zoom. Zoom. You know. We are grateful for our altar flowers this morning and for the coffee fellowship. Thank you for providing that. And we should have some birthdays. Uh, Lark yeah. Detweiler. Kristen Thompson. On the 16th, Nancy Rank on the 17th. And let's sing Happy Birthday. All right. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, God bless you. Happy Birthday. St. Matthews, welcome, welcome home. home. Yeah.